Welcome, everyone, to the First Name Basis Podcast. Uh, I'm Sheetal Jaitley, your host of this podcast and the CEO of Tribal Scale. This is where we love to have our guests come on and have some real talk about the times of today and especially of what's happening in digital. Uh, today with me, I have a good friend of mine. His name is Rory Capern. Um, we're going to get into a little bit about you, Rory, and some of your history, but welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Great to be here. I love it, dude. What do you got behind you? What is that? You got a little bit of New York City? So Yeah, a little New York, a little Vancouver Island up here, which was the inspiration yeah. for what we're going to get into in a sec. And then uh, when my daughter, my first daughter, my first kid, my daughter was born, um, this was her, the painting that my uh, grandmother gave to us to signify her spirit animal. So that's a screech owl. Oh, wow. Um, it actually doesn't resemble a screech owl. It has a personality, but it's kind of a cool graphic. So I, it's, it's super cool, man. That's awesome. That's right. awesome. Um, Rory, I want our listeners to get to know you a little bit. And you got a very cool history. And so why don't you talk to us a little bit about your background? Like, what sure. have you done? How did yeah. you get to where you are? <laughs> I'll give you the uh, abridged version because it can go quite a while. Um, I think that if I were to encapsulate the last sort of 10 or 15 years of my career, I'm kind of the Canadian tech guy who never left Toronto. Um, I've been working with some really large sort of intergalactic technology companies um, and then have been kind of progressing ever more to the place where I am today, but I'll kind of give you that, that background. So uh, born and raised in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, there for are, the you, first... are, you, are you a Leafs fan or a Senators fan? Well, it, I migrated to a Leafs fandom probably okay. halfway through a 20 year shift in Toronto. I, I held the line on, on Senators for the first 10 years and then yeah. Switch. Um, a okay. because I was going to some really awesome games, and B it just I think it happens by osmosis in Toronto. Yeah, um, okay, good. I was going to end this podcast if you said centers. So. <laughs> <laughs> you and pretty much everybody else. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> sure. Um, born and raised in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, for the first twenty years of my life, and lived in Toronto for the the, the next twenty years. Um, definitely consider myself a kind of resident Torontonian based on the migration path, including Leafs fandom and everything else that goes in between. Um, it's, I've had an just incredible run through Toronto. Um, I graduated from uh, the Ivy School at Western and beelined it to Toronto and have been there ever since. Um, so I'm up until two months ago, which we'll get right. to in a second. Right. Um, my early stage sort of business career was really focused on the internet for reasons that are going to become pretty clear. I am um, in the, in the summer between the first and second year of business school, I tripped into an amazing consulting gig uh, that took me to San Francisco. And I saw in 1999, the internet blow up while I was in the Valley and decided that this was what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life. So I caught the bug blow up by like the, the, the good just, part of the blow up. The good yeah, part sorry. of the blow up. Because then, <laughs> then it really blew up. <laughs> <laughs> then it exploded and that wasn't as cool. Um, okay. But the, yeah, in the earlier stage, it was, it was really the beginning. The work that I was doing was actually focused on the less sort of sexy, bubbly web and more on how the web was actually going to drive you know, efficiencies and better performance for businesses and people. Um, okay. The consulting firm that I worked for was called AT Carney. They were masters of sourcing, so buying stuff. Mm -hmm. And the idea was there were a bunch of players out of the Valley that were building businesses that are, you know, Ariba, Commerce One, some of the ones that we've heard of before mm -hmm. that were in their very infancy back then who were reshaping how companies were going to buy stuff. And my job was to go out and figure out how much of an impact that was going to have on the company's business and how you might be able to harness some of that. And it became this massively eye-opening experience to everything that's to come. Right. So I just right. wanted to get on the wave, right? Like I've talked to a lot of people about career advice and, one of the first ones is just find a great wave and get on it and stay yeah, on it. As long so, as so, so well, that, that's a really good point. So one of, the, well, one of your career advice is like find, find a trend that you are excited about and passionate about and, like, yeah. and, and take that ride. Right. So, I mean, I think the, the early stage story there is I just saw this massive transformation at the rock face. Like mm -hmm. a lot of folks I think were saying, yeah, I'm not sure if this web thing is going to stick or not. I mean, we've heard all the jokes, but I actually saw it changing business at yeah. a, Deep sort of operational level and not so much on the glossy, you know, brandy level um, yeah. and knew that it was going to be really, really important for business and was early, relatively early into that. Um, came back to finish my degree at Ivy and got recruited by the Boston Consulting Group. And just as sort of these two forces align, BCG's global uh, e-com practice was headquartered out of Toronto. Okay. So I 
came and started into a consultative strategy consulting gig into econ, which lasted a hot second before the explosion that we talked about. <laughs> in, um, how to well, what, 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 what was even considered econ back then? Like if you think about that time, I mean, eBay, there was, you know, some sophisticated people who were selling on that platform. Like these things weren't easy to just go sell on, right? You had to yeah. have this like escrow account, I remember. And <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was like the money's held somewhere else until you <laughs> verify that your product's been delivered. My cash and why? Right? Yeah, like, no. I don't trust this website to actually <laughs> just take my money and not send me the goods, you know? Was, what information do you need? Yeah, no, I, I remember all of that. Um, yeah. So what we find second nature now was just like, was non-existent. <laughs> Right. right. We forget that these are massive building blocks on the way yeah. to what is today. Right? Yeah. Um, so e-com back then was really business on the internet. Yeah. It was, I, I, I got my classified did, on the law. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I was working in pharma on um, taking days off of the drug delivery cycle by using internet technology. And we actually called it that, like internet technology back then. I love it. Um, so, you know, World it was Wide all Web. <laughs> right. Um, what was interesting about that for me was the reason why I was recruited into BCG was I think I was pretty rounded in business school. I was doing my well own school. I was doing a bunch of extracurricular stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, just generally curious about a lot of different things. And that's what they were looking for. Um, got to a place I really enjoyed the BCG experience. It was a, a great way to learn. The how to build PowerPoint. Yeah, how to do PowerPoint, how to do spreadsheet, how to speak. I, have, I, I love taking a shot at you consultants. I, yeah, I, no, man. Look, I, look, I, I, I it, it was a it was a two year hit. Um, it was a heck but of a lot. You learn a lot. lot. You, you, heard, you learn a lot, and you work so, hard, right? Like, right. You know, the one thing I want to talk to you about, I think, you know, there's this notion, and you, and you see this a lot in the companies that you're working with now, and we'll get into some of those amazing organizations. But a lot of people come into tech because they think it's the trend, and the don't necessarily come in with that work ethic of like what you have to go through at BCG. Like a 12 hour day is just normal. Right. Right. And a hundred hour week is standard. Right? And a hundred hour week is standard. And the work ethic that was expected for you to be BCG is because you are the best. And you know that if you, you not only got to put in the hard work, um, but you got to do it smart and it comes with long hours on being able to get that done right. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, it's one of the things that I try and instill in the teams that I'm working with as much as I can. Being in a trend sets the bar even higher, right? You need to understand right. the foundations of the space that you're in. Uh, mm -hmm. And that requires a lot of reading and a lot of interviewing and a lot of discussion. I mean, you and I met at Ace Tech and went, what, that first like day, just yeah. deep talk about whatever the hell we were interested in at the time. Right. But you need to have that curiosity and satisfy it with hours. It's, mm -hmm. it's time spent. Thoroughly understanding the fundaments of how technology works and how it's going to be applied and what the opportunities look like. And that's where, you know, if there's a cliche to our space, it's the slick, you know, uh, cufflinks and cologne sort of fast talking tech guy who doesn't really understand what's underneath a lot of that. And, sure. and then they get exposed pretty quickly and they typically don't last very long. Right. The, the idea yeah. of really being able to develop an intellectual property foundation in the technology space, whatever space you're in. Right. It requires a level of commitment and time and effort and dedication that goes beyond what most people are interested in doing once they actually get into it. Right. And, so and, and I, I think, I think it's good to define that. Um, I'm not a coder. You're not a coder. Um, however, we do have conversations with engineering teams and we do, we have spent the time to understand what pain points they have, what they're going through, why code is set up a certain way. You know, I'm sitting in the office today um, with Alvin, one of our great engineers, and just watching him work and talking to him today. You know, I'm learning a lot and, uh, from, from what he's doing, but you, you have to have that natural curiosity of knowing more than just your domain, right? Like if you yeah, really want to be well-rounded, like you got to do that. For the non-coder, it's even more important. Right? Of course. Like the... the the most dangerous salesperson in technology can actually go like three or four rounds in the deeper parts of the questions that come on how the sausage gets made, right? Yeah, of course. I found if you're the guy who's just sort of passing off the, you know, the hard questions to the tech guys right away, you don't get as far. Yeah. But if you can actually learn enough to be informative and interesting in the context of how a product works or how it's going to be applied, 
you go a lot further in the context of development. Well, you, you lose empathy, right? Like my sales career, I always say, you know, I'm doing someone a favor. If I'm in their office, I'm doing them a favor. I'm actually there to help. I'm, I'm going to put myself in your shoes. And if I can't understand the problems that that person across the desk is having for me, because I haven't taken the time to understand what those issues are myself, then... I can't be empathetic and I'm probably not going to get the deal. I'm actually just wasting that person's time. You're then just a salesperson, right? You're not right. just, you're not, you're not, you're not someone there to provide a solution. You're pushing a product instead you're, of selling a problem. You're, right? Well, you're pushing, or you're, or you're pushing insights onto someone, <laughs> having right. the person beside you go, put, go, go push the solution, which is not the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So the, you know, for me, the ability to continually push the edge of that took me away from, from a, you know, my own career out of the strategy sort of coaching role very early in my career into how do I actually go and run the ball? Like I want to be in the operator seat driving business. And so over the course of my career, I went out of, out of sort of the strategy consulting area into business development, which I'll affectionately refer to as sort of like fancy sales yeah. um, and into sales leadership roles where it was really driving revenue. And that old adage has been very true to me, which is, you know, the closer you are to the customer and, driving top line revenue in the business, the more relevant you become. And from my own yeah. perspective, it's the more learning, right? The Absolutely. most learning happens at the rock face with the market where- Well, you, you, you and I are biased, but I think like a uh, top sales or business development professional is probably one of the hardest jobs. Uh, it's, it, I'll, it's, I'll say that it, it, with the same caveat. Yes, I'm biased, but yes, I believe that. Yeah, no, I'm no, I, mean, I say that because you see, it's like if you see churn in an organization, the highest churn is always that department. Yeah. It's, it's always that department. And the ones who make it are the ones who actually invest the time, energy, and dedication to understanding the solution that they're able to provide, right? And you gotta yeah. be well-rounded. You gotta, you gotta understand every aspect of how the sausage is made to be able to do that. That's yeah. not for everyone. That's not easy to do. No, it's not. One of the old adages that I've used quite a bit is that you know, oftentimes in this position, whether you're leading a revenue team or you know, in a general management function or whatever, it becomes English to English translation. Right? Right. Like everybody speaks the same language, but their slant and their perspective is very different. And being able to put that together to solve a problem or to do good work is, is kind of an art form here, I think. And that, that I think is what makes it so hard. It's a comprehensive understanding across multiple functions where Many professionals go deep in one. Right. They sew all that up together to go to market with a business, whether it's sales or anything else. Sure. Um, it's definitely a, the challenge that I've enjoyed over the course. So, of you, so you, so you left this. I, I love it because you did the whole strategy side. You saw how the sausage is made on that side, and you go, "I'm going to the other side of the table, and I'm going to try to be tactical on a lot of these things I talked about." Right. So, so where'd you go? What'd you do? So I did what I will affectionately call for the sake of time, a random walk down Bay Street. Um, I left, <laughs> I left uh, BCG to go to Bell, uh, where I was part of the convergence group back when you could say that word in telco. Uh, <laughs> the idea was there's a lot happening in the technology space. They were mashing together a bunch of services inside Bell. And we had 10 companies to spin up out of nothing as sort of an internal entrepreneurship project. Cool. Uh, Incredibly cool experience. Learned a ton. It was a very difficult time to be doing that. Within a Isn't that tough to do in like a, such a big beast as Bell? Like spinning yeah. up 10 companies in a big organization? Yeah, it was really hard. It was also the first initiative that the incoming CEO cut when he took the job. Um, okay. So it was, you know, because, it's really <laughs> because it's really yeah. hard. Because it's really hard. And it's kind of, it becomes kind of a distraction too from right. the main focus well, of the business. If it's not done well, I mean, so, you know, Cole's notes on that one was it was so hard and so interesting that I wrote my thesis in my MBA about in structuring for innovation in telecoms because it was like such a hard problem to solve. And I was so right. interested in it. Right. very entrepreneurial by nature and had taken this role to try and drive that kind of entrepreneurial change in a very large company. Mm -hmm. And what you realize really quickly is that the intellectual idea of starting these businesses up is like 1% of the problem. Mm -hmm. that actually you know, executing an operating execution. business to get it done is, is the hard part while competitors in the space who don't have those encumbrances to care about your issues about speed. Like they're doing so as fast I, as they can and they typically win. I, I always say this. I think the, the organizations that win are the ones that hire entrepreneurs or are the ones that actually give people the ability to say, okay, come in with an entrepreneurial mindset and use all leverage all the assets that the, that the firm has to go be an intra, entrepreneur to go add value. Yeah, but it's it's hard to do. You got you got to give them autonomy. And you got to give them the space to be able to go do that. It's, it's so much it's easier really, said than done. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it makes perfect sense on the outside. And then you go and try and do it. And it's, it's really, really, really challenging to execute on. For sure. um, I actually left Bell to go into my first entrepreneurial venture, which is a company that still exists today called Hot Specs, which was online research okay. um, with a couple of founders from, from biz school. And that was the switch, right? So it was this idea of sitting on untold amounts of capital and resources within Bell. Like there's just a giant right. company with all kinds of depth. And then moving to a pure startup environment where we weren't sure that we could make ranch the next month, like regular. Right. Um, and, and back when you're doing this, it's not like it wasn't as easy as, hey, I could just spin up all this code in a cloud. It was like, I got to nope. do this on my actual machine and I need a server and I need exactly. to plug in all this stuff. Yeah. And finding people that, you know, a very thin bench of people that were actually able to do what we needed to do in different For parts sure. of the world to do it. For sure. Um, but that, that to me was, what was really important about that move was I'd gone from, to give you that lineage, gone from the strategy role at BCG to the kind of internal entrepreneur at Bell to a, you know, sell or starve environment mm -hmm. in a startup and, and fell in love with it. I mean, the idea of just doing whatever it took to drive a business forward, um, being really sharp on the value proposition, being able to go out and sell it, delivering it on the back end and doing it all with like three people and changing the, you know, the printer toner while we were at it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Was that environment that really brought home the idea that, you know, I, I love, business i love to sell i love all of these different kinds so, of content. so just just to, just to play on the flip side of this you love having no personal time uh <laughs> you love making no money uh <laughs> you, you love yeah. working all day in very high stressful situations you're an yeah. entrepreneur <laughs> that's what <Yeah>. you do <laughs> that's it right and yeah, like, i love it i fell in love with it <laughs> yeah certainly the bit about the money was true we didn't make it time <laughs> when they didn't for a long time the, um, my, my mom says this to me all the time. I said this at yeah. our takeover conference. She's like, are you crazy? You're quitting. When I yeah. quit my job to start tri tribal school, she's like, are you crazy? What is wrong with you? <laughs> you well, you kind of have to be a bit nuts, right? And that's the, yeah. it, it's a healthy dose of, of being nuts and, and taking a risk that probably doesn't pencil out when you do the math, but you know, it, it, it's a lifestyle and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a mode of working that's, that's super fun. It's actually, if I fast forward a bunch, so I you know, went to Torstar, uh, into, into Torstar Digital after my MBA where I'd written this thesis because I thought they had the formula right. right. right? So that's where all of network got started. I was working on the classifieds platform that was to compete with Craigslist for a newspaper back then. A lot of really neat stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And what Torstar had figured out was they needed to take the organization and move it outside of their building. They just couldn't have the new stuff being built inside the core of the newspaper business. And there was an amazing team of people who I'm still very close with. Yeah, uh, the, what a team came out of that. Like, yeah. It was like a tour, yeah. There's a tour star digital mafia, right? That came there out is, of there is. Yeah. And it's a fun mafia to be a part of. Um, yeah, so many of us I'm, went I'm on. lucky I get to be like this honorary guy who's friends with all of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the experience there, I think actually there's a story in that, which was in that, in that incubator, we learned a lot about how to drive companies from inside entrepreneurship as you, as you describe mm -hmm. it. And those skills took me into a career into larger companies that were effectively doing the same thing. Um, you know, I did, I went from Torstar, quick, uh, quick stop into Lava Life where I ran biz dev for the, the dating company for a while, cool. which was super interesting. That got me super deep into the online ad space. And into did it get you a date? Uh, fortunately, I was <laughs> married at the time. Uh, okay. but definitely <laughs> saw a lot of dating going on around me. Sure. Um, the interesting part about that, though, at the time, Lava Life was the third largest digital media buyer in the country. Wow. Um, so we were doing enormous amounts of performance advertising, and that was the, the pointy end of the media business in math and, and, and sort of the more technical side of it that I really enjoyed mm -hmm. um, and got introduced to Microsoft there. And so um, went to take the first job at an intergalactically large technology company from Canada as the sort of the biz dev guy inside the consumer portfolio at at Microsoft started in the Atlas space. There was an ad server for Microsoft that okay. we bought. Yeah. Um, and then was really heavily involved in all these brands that make me smile now because we don't use them very much anymore. Uh, Windows Phone, Internet Explorer, Windows Live, Hotmail, Messenger, <laughs> you know, all the stuff that used to be really amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And drove that sort of portfolio of businesses. What was your Hotmail alias? Uh, I was Arkapern at Hotmail. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You didn't have uh, something it, that really embarrassed the crap out of you. <laughs> um, but it was super interesting, right? It was a massive digital ecosystem that had been built 
inside Microsoft and, and lots of really cool work involved in getting that out to partners, but also the ad businesses behind most of those properties were really big. And I just honestly fell in love with the ad technology space then. Mm -hmm. um, it was this sort of perfect combination of art and science that I was really interested in and um, was, drive, was building a, a, an ad network for Microsoft internally uh, with, with Atlas at the, at the core of it. And that's when I started competing with Google. Um, so I ran into Google a bunch of times in sales pitches and um, I think I got a little too threatening because they actually called. It was a buddy of mine that I used to work at BCG with. Who's it? huge mentor of mine really for a long time a guy by the name of Jeremy Butters who called and said like why why just come over here and do this here stop, a lot fighting. Fun. stop, so stop fighting us <laughs> right yeah well let's play on the same team um so in uh 2010 I got the shot at Google very early in in Canada it was mm -hmm. I think I was the 35th guy in the door in the Toronto office back in those wow. days um wow. and it was that period that's of time. You don't even realize it. That's just a decade ago. And you don't even realize yeah. like Google was that small on camera. Well, like that. So the really old lions at Google are looking down the barrel of 20 years now. right? But yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It went through that first 10 years of still very, in fact, like successful business. But of course, it was really booming through that time. And, and the Canadian operation was very successful, but mushrooming at the time when I came in. Mm -hmm. So I got to do everything outside of search for Google in Canada for like a five year window, which was unbelievable, right? My, yeah. my main focus was double click. And I got a chance to work with most of Canada's publishers in you know, building their revenue streams online and pivoting. Huge, out. just massive, yeah. just a you know, massive piece of business for Google. Yeah, super interesting and a really important pivot, right? Like we get into very heady issues like the freedom of the press and this, the health of, of journalism and, and that kind of yeah. stuff. When you start talking about pivoting out of traditional media into digital, very hard shift. Um, but a lot of fun and a lot of really good work done along the way with an incredible team at Google. Uh, just this dream team of people. Every corner of that office is filled with incredible, awesome people to be working with. And we just had an incredible ride for, I was there for five years, driving this sort of partnerships mandate where mm -hmm. back to the conversation we were having before, I really felt like by the end of my time there, what I was trying to do is stitch together all these platforms that Google had an incredible amount of momentum behind. You know, YouTube, Android, DoubleClick, Google Pay, like all this fun stuff. And uh, everything the opposite of Microsoft. <laughs> Those five right. years also, right? Yeah. Like Zoom phone or whatever the heck they were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I'll, I'll save those remarks. I sold all those products. <laughs> but yeah, it was a bit of a different vibe. Um, so the, the, the consumer portfolio and, and all those sort of platforms that we were working on were blowing up at that time. And it gave me just an incredible view of how Google runs what I think may be the most successful, effective company in the world mm -hmm. uh, from inside of it, in, including, you know, talent management and, you know, all the reporting systems and the way that sort of that sausage gets made was just an yeah. incredibly important opportunity to learn how to execute. Well, even if you look right now, like everybody's talking about OKRs and how stuff like that stuff, that's all coming out of Google, right? Like, I well, mean, yeah. And it's actually, yeah. you know, sets up the conversation. Like, what do you, what am I doing now? I mean, much yeah. of the lessons that I've picked up along the way from all of these different companies have set me up now to be pretty useful in the context of helping scaling companies that are much smaller lay down some of these foundations and practices that actually work really really well and, and figuring out how to localize them when you take some of that magic outside of the candy store that is google from a resource right. perspective and try and land them into individual companies with different cultures and all that kind of stuff it gets a little more nuanced but much of what i've been able to pick up came from inside the belly of these gigantic companies that were that were doing extraordinarily well absolutely um, so I went from Google, I, it was a really, really hard decision to leave Google. Uh, yeah. I, I still treat and feel uh, like a lot of those people are family. We just so, what made you, so what made you leave? You're working with a team that you love. You got products that have all started getting traction. You started to stitch together this amazing portfolio of solutions together. What inside you said... I should leave all this awesome stuff I've done here. Well, this, there, this amazing there, situation I've been. Was, I, I'll underscore how hard it was, right? Really, really sure. challenging. Um, two things, I think, in the end. One, um, I was getting to a place inside the organization at Google where I was either going to have to put in a very long shift at the level that I was at before I would have a chance to move up and no guarantee of moving up. Right. Um, that is a absolute rock star global organization of incredible people 
who sure. you know, want to run the Canadian business, you have one heck of a fight on your hands. And, you know, the woman who's doing it now, Sabrina, is no slouch by any degree. She's right. you know, she, one of the she, sharpest, she, sharpest people there. Exactly. And, and that team is just stacked full of incredible people. So there was no guarantee that I was going to go up to the next level. I was very happy to compete for it, but you know, it was, it was no guarantees after a chunk of time. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a upward mobility question if I didn't want to go to the States and right. I really want to stay in Canada, right? My sort of primary objective professionally is to have an impact on the Canadian technology economy and, you know, be a part of this. And I didn't want to not for any period of time want to go stateside. Um, the other thing was that every once in a while, you, you know, an opportunity lands on your lap that you can't say no to. And mm -hmm. Twitter came calling and said, we want you to run the whole show in Canada. Right. And so um, it was a particularly turbulent time at Twitter, but it was a chance to lead a business, which is what mm -hmm. I had been sort of looking at doing over time uh, in the Canadian business. Um, and there were sort of a confluence of things underneath that. One, it was a part of what I was going through at Google was there was so much momentum behind the business that you wondered some days if you had to show up, right? Like, yeah, like do I even have to be, if I disappear, this will still keep going. What would really happen, right? Yeah. Like double click will be double click, search will be search, like all these businesses will be yeah. fine. Um, Twitter was in a different place, right? They were experiencing a lot of headwind at the time. And mm -hmm. part of what drove me into that role was I really wanted to test myself, right? A, do I have what it takes to lead kind of all up in the business? Because you only get that experience by doing it. Yeah, you just um, you got you, you got to put yourself in that uncomfortable situation. Whether you know what to do or not know what to do, right. you're gonna have to figure it out. Right, and just get in the chair and you know do the best you can. Um, and two was um, you know the opportunity to make an impact on a platform that I really believed in. Right, what what Twitter is doing is very important. It remains very important uh, uh, long past my departure from the company. Um, so it was a it was kind of mission driven. It was also this idea of testing myself. It was a leadership opportunity and it was a chance to do another chapter in Canada that was really important for me. Um, and so I took it and man, um, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. wild. Yeah. But, uh, and a great, great team there too. Like you guys. Yes. That, you know, that, that team is awesome. A, it's such an awesome team over there. Yeah. yeah. And they remain an awesome team. Um, the ability to sort of come in and, and build that in the earlier stages was extremely appealing and um, the work was fascinating. Um, platform meant something, but it was also that early build scenario, right? So mm -hmm. I, I kind of really enamored by the cultural and the energy of, of working in that kind of early stage environment. It was very similar to what Google felt like in the early days for me. And it was an opportunity yeah. to recreate those, uh, that sort of dynamic. Uh, and I think we did, right? We built a, a really strong team and accelerated Canada's presence for Twitter and, and in the market pretty significantly over that period of time. So side note, what are your thoughts? Like Twitter is arguably one of the most impactful social media platforms out there right now. I mean, you would have said Facebook a couple of years ago or whatever, but you know, well, I don't I, know. you might. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, but, but if you, but if you take a look at it, the power of the tweet now is, is, is magnified. I mean, especially with a president who loves to tweet, right? For better, what, or for, worse. for better or for worse. So, you know, Twitter has been making a lot of changes, I'll say, um, of, of actually saying, and Jack Dorsey just did an amazing podcast also on some of the mistakes he, he's, he's made in the early days. But where do you, where do you see the next evolution of, of where Twitter is going to go? Well, I'd start by saying that the moves that they're making now are the right ones. Okay. Um, when I first got into Twitter, the idiom inside was that it was the free speech wing of the free speech party. Right. Um, right? So the idea that you could say... Just say anything. Know, yeah. Right. Um, that is changing. And I think it's changing for the better. Uh, not to suggest that free speech isn't as important now as, as it ever was, but the onus that the company takes in terms of uh, facilitating that conversation comes with responsibility that I think it's now approaching uh, dealing with. And I think, you know, I'm battling the misinformation, right? Well, th it, there's that. What I would share without going, cause that's like a whole other two hour podcast is the, the issue. <laughs> we got time, man. We got time. We can, <laughs> we can edit this into like six parts if you want. <laughs> but, but the issues inside managing content like that are far more complicated than most people realize. Um, Absolutely. It's a great deal of work from some very intelligent people going on all the time to try and solve it. And it's complicated. Um, 
the and, and if you can, if you can share, I remember having a meeting with you, and it was Kevin Callahan who was, <laughs> we, we, we were in your office, yeah. um, and we were having a ch chat about like operationally how Twitter's even doing it. Like there was this whole team out in the Philippines, I think you guys had that was like yeah. monitoring yeah. tweets. If you could talk a little bit about that, I think yeah. it, was, it was super interesting how it was, how, it, how it was really, being done. Yeah, it's a cool story about about Toronto, and Canada too, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, so the you know monitoring content on Twitter is a gigantic task, right? It's a yeah. billion tweets uh, a day, um, which is a lot of content with a lot of signal and, and much to sift through. Um, at the time, the struggle was, how do you staff a team to be able to deal with that scale and volume of problems, basically? For sure. Um, and so there was a manual component of that, and we actually, I'm proud to tell you, we stood up a team in Toronto um, to do that. And it was because we could staff for all the languages or almost all the languages that we needed within like 20 kilometers of the office. That's right. right? So we have this, multi this multicultural vibe right. that's in the city played to your advantage to so, solve this problem. Yeah. So we tapped into it and said like, let's, let's take advantage of that opportunity to house multiple languages all under one roof and, and be able to do that in Canada, which was fantastic and a giant team and it grew really quickly. But the other side of that story that was just as interesting to me was um, there were sort of two issues at the time that we were wrestling with one uh, at that time, really, really hard to recruit talent for an engineering role in the Valley always is but like at that time in particular. And I had whatever 40 empty seats in the Toronto office. So mm -hmm. went to San Francisco and said, guys, like we have an incredible pool of talent in Toronto. I know you know that, but like we can house them here at that time. It was the first wave of Trump's ban travel ban. Yeah. 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 Um, so there were a bunch of folks that were really concerned about being extradited and we had a home for them, but we were also talking about landing more engineering resource for Twitter into Canada. And uh, we did it. We hired the first Twitter engineers uh, in Toronto. Awesome. And what, much of what they were focused on, though, was the AI around the AI. The AI automated story, yeah. algorithms for content control. Mm -hmm. right? So you, you needed to solve this sort of uh, content quality problem with human beings, but you also needed to solve it at a scale of half a billion tweets a day algorithmically. And so the ability to apply this extraordinarily vibrant technology community in Toronto to a very important problem was really a very satisfying piece of work that we did with at Twitter Canada at that time to you know, make sure that Twitter was tapping into the resource and the talent that we had to solve arguably one of the most important problems of the day, at least as far yeah, as Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. I want to stop before we start going into what you're doing now. Okay. Um, I want to, I, well, I want to give you some rapid fire questions just to get to know you better. Okay. Hit me. All right. What's the last movie you watched? Last movie I watched was, It's been a while. We haven't been watching much TV out here. I watched To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, wow. Yeah. An old one. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, if you could travel anywhere outside of Canada, where would you go? Tough one. I love to travel. Um, my best adventures so far have been in Southeast Asia, okay. but I haven't been to Africa yet. And I think that's my next stop. That's the next stop. All right. Um, I want to promote a local business in Victoria, <laughs> where you where, where you're at right now. Okay. Um, so, what is the spot you want to go eat at out there? So there's I a, come to visit you. Where are you taking me? There's a little tiny uh, Italian joint called Pagliacci's downtown Victoria, and it's a family tradition. Um, cool. They make this dish called the prawn broker that I would happily share with you. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then let me do one more. Last but not least. Hmm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to go into my repertoire to try to throw <laughs> you a curveball. And it's, it's, <laughs> um, it, actually, it, 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 I, I, we, we haven't really touched on COVID. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw you a question based on COVID. What is it that we're doing in Canada that is, making like helping us really flatten this curve and what else do you think we should be doing to to really eliminate this problem in this country so i think what we do well is very true to our culture which is cooperation right mm -hmm. i think canada rallied fast um you know stayed much. home yeah. listens yeah. There, there wasn't a sort of defiant prove to me why i need to wear a mask overtone as much as we've seen in other countries and sure why I need to stay home. That's sort of a challenge to science, 
And I don't think we saw at the same scale in Canada as we've seen in other parts of the world. And sure. I think that's part of our secret sauce, right? It's a yep. highly intelligent community of people who, you know, believe in science more than they don't. So I, I would say that if we could do more, you know, to me, I think the economic recovery is the piece that I'm the most focused on in terms of doing more, you know, not to suggest that we haven't done lots, but to me, there's another chapter unfolding, you know, back to my tech roots around how we mobilize more businesses into the, inter, into the online space in a way that's going to be healthy and uh, help the recovery faster. Sure. A lot of work going into how do we resource? I mean, the, the story behind Shopify just makes me proud to be Canadian. Absolutely. Much. Day, and that, that's an enormously powerful vehicle, but there's a lot of other stuff that needs to get done mm -hmm. in the context of, you know, inventory sourcing, marketing, you know, staffing and talent and all the pieces that have to go around a real surge into an online economy that, you know, frankly could be bigger and better. Um, yep. That's what we need to be doing more. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for doing that little rapid fire with me. I, I know I didn't tell you about that. I like to surprise people. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I see this Facebook post and it tells me that my boy Rory's getting the hell out of here. He's moving to the West Coast. And I'm like, what's going on? What are you going out there for? Everything has happened. Toronto's supposed to be this buzzing city that is going to become this next tech hub and all innovation is going to come out of this GTA area. And here you go, pick up and move to the West Coast. Why do you do such crazy things? Yeah, well, a few things. First <laughs> of all, um, what you will never hear from me is any rocks thrown at Toronto. I love the city of Toronto and I always will. And I'm a huge believer in what's happening there and benefited personally and will hopefully will continue to be a part of what is an incredible story. So it's certainly not an anti-Toronto thing by any stretch. The, the statement that everything important that happens in Canada happens in Toronto is, is part of what I challenged and I didn't realize it until right. I started looking around. The, the it's also why people don't like people from Toronto because we well, all think I, everything happens in Toronto. Because we just live that. in our little, we live in this yeah. bubble here. And we probably deserve some of that. And I'll count yeah. myself as part of I'll, it. I'll, I'll count myself as that too. <laughs> the, um, so first of all, personally, my, my, uh, my wife is from out here on Vancouver Island. And we've been coming here every year for the last 18 years. And it's absolutely beautiful. Sorry, I said Victoria. You're on Vancouver Island. Right? No, Victoria's on Vancouver Island. I'm just oh, you're on Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah. Right. Like my geography's all off now. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, uh, I, I, you know. I'll go on record and say I think this is the most beautiful part of the best country in the world. So from a lifestyle perspective, it's always lined up really well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been coming out for my, when I met my wife, she was going to come back here uh, to start her career. And I somehow convinced her to stick around in Toronto for 20 years. So the deal that we made when we, when we met and ultimately, you know, got married was that we would come out every year for summer and we would eventually move out this way, you know, for retirement or for at some point, no timestamp on it. So I always, in the back of my mind thought there's so much going on in Toronto. I'll right. Never leave. right. I'll retire on Vancouver Island. But about now, closing on two years ago, about a year and a half ago, my daughter, who's now 13, did a seven-slide PowerPoint presentation on why she needed to go to the school that her mom went to. And of course, as a sales guy, she had me at the open, right? Yeah. Like she had gone through this pitch of why she needs to go. And we made a very unselfish decision back then is to send her to boarding school out here at a place called Shawnigan Lake, which is now 10 minutes from my house. Okay. Um, and uh, it was an incredibly great decision for her. She's benefited really well. But we realized within about a month that we had shipped our daughter across the country. And she <laughs> we only had this sort of six-year window left with her. And we wanted to move yeah. the house to her. Um, so a couple things happened. At the same time, I've been getting a lot of requests. I was at the Weather Network at the time, another amazing uh, professional mm -hmm. chapter of my life. But I was getting a lot of questions to help to be on, on boards, to advise, to help scaling companies, you know, grow effectively mm -hmm. and I was limited in my time and my ability to do that. So I th was starting to take that really seriously as, you know, what would a model look like where I'd be able to work across a number of companies and kind of lay down this playbook of lessons that I'd learned in the technology space from some very fast moving large companies. And then also at Palmer X itself, right? So being a, having a chance to lead inside of a Canadian HQ company was an important part of my own journey as yeah, well. Sure. Wanted to answer this call of like, how do I help more? How do I work with more founders and entrepreneurs in Canada to help scale this out? So I put those two things together, right? There's this dynamic of every, every summer when I was leaving from my summer vacation, we get on the plane, I think like, why am I leaving here? It's so beautiful. And the second question was, well, what the hell would I ever do in Victoria? Like I'm going back to Toronto. I was going back to Microsoft or Google or Twitter right. or whatever. 
you know, there was no question that I was going to keep doing that. This time I thought, well, what is going on in Victoria? And two or three phone calls later, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but what I found was absolutely unbelievable. So there's a incredible technology scene in the city of Victoria and the, the foundations of it are fascinating. Um, first of all, and the long story short is there are a lot of amazing companies in Victoria that are doing amazing things. And I have now the chance to work with several of them to right. help them continue their, their growth. But you know, the founding conditions are really interesting, right? The, what I learned was, you know, a, a bunch of years ago, a number of University of Waterloo comp sci profs split off from the University of Waterloo and came and founded the comp sci program at the University of Victoria. Right. And had been spitting out, you know, very high caliber computer science engineers. Some into great the talent, yeah. Yeah, and they don't want to leave, right? As I said earlier, it's this incredible, yeah, well, I, I'm in paradise. Why do I want to get out of here? Why well, can't I just do what I want to do here? And so many of there's a very entrepreneurial vibe here as well because the market wasn't swimming in you know venture capital money or really any kind of money. So these guys kind of bootstrapped themselves. Uh, figure in, out a business, yeah. In the field, figure it out, but not leave. Mm -hmm. And what's happened as a result is in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, a confluence of a few things. One, the venture capital money found its way to the talent. And there's now quite a bit of funding for um, what has become a really amazing ecosystem. Two, and I think a lot of it's the draw of the climate and a lot of things that are kind of not that dissimilar to what you might find in, in the Valley is really successful technology people have cashed in wherever they were and moved here. And now yeah. they've continued to do what they do from here. And, and, and so, you know, I've been here. And so I've been having other conversations with others and you and I talked about this, I think two months ago. Yeah. And there's been at least five different times where people have told me about their founder or their old CEO or their old partner cashing out and moving there. Yeah. And so, yeah, you got this amazing community of, successful people who've gone over there, got their money over there and probably thought they're going to retire and got an itch to go do something else and help out. Right. Well, you know what? I'm not it's even this sure awesome, this awesome store. Yeah. I'm not sure that it's so much about retiring as it is just changing location. Um, yeah. I want to live in this ideal thing and this ideal climate and, and, and environment and then do what they do from there. So yeah, sure. the bench has grown out significantly and there's now an ecosystem in Victoria that I would put up against, a lot of other cities around um, uh, intellectual property in the space, a knowledge of how to build companies, the financial end of the market's now figured out. So there's a really solid investment community. And then the entrepreneurs themselves. And you know me, I'm very enamored by that community. And yeah. It's just a, what it feels like, and you're a rounder as well. It feels like Toronto about 12 years ago. Which is awesome, right? Right. It was just that, like, anything's possible. We're all in this together. We got a blank canvas. Let's figure this out. We can do it, right? We can yeah. do it from here and we're going to. And I've yeah. sort of found that same community here with a couple of companies that I'm working with that are um, definitely of the same mind. So, so talk to me about a couple of companies that you're working with. Sure. So uh, one of the ones that we started talking about, you and I, was Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. These guys do um, online uh, referrals, right? So they're the, the module inside an app or a website that, basically allows a customer to tell another customer that they can come and take a look. And, and Thanks for the guest blog on our site, by the way. Give a plug of course. to that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's so interesting about that business for me, first of all, the team's incredible. They've got just, a, they built this thing like Fort Knox. The technology is amazing. Works really well. It sort of holds water everywhere we test it at the enterprise right. level. But also there's this amazing intellectual challenge in marketing that I was enamored by, which was as a guy who's been around acquisition marketing for a long time, um, you know, the idea of being able to find your highest value customers from your own customer base at mm -hmm. a cost level is extremely compelling, right? So if you mm -hmm. told me that I could substitute 40% of my acquisition by, you know, incenting my existing customer to sell my product for me or to refer it, um, I would do it. And I hadn't really seen it done well until now, right? So there's now an opportunity to embed a technology inside the context of an existing business that basically automates or allows this functionality to happen. And the returns are enormous, right? So you right. users, particularly now in a time of COVID, most acquisition budgets are way down from where they were and companies are looking- And it's tougher too. I mean, it's, it's uh, customer acquisition is tougher now, right? Like totally. you have, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we were talking about my Peloton story and I was like, yeah, hey, totally. I was like, I got a Peloton and within a month or two, I know six others who got a Peloton and all asked me for, how, like, how I thought about it, whatever. I was like, Peloton should have just given me a Peloton for free. Right. 
Exactly. I'm up to 11 people on the call. <laughs> well, and, and I think <laughs> companies that figure this out are going to have an advantage. And it's not like it's a brand new space, but there's, it's been rife with technological execution issues for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very promising one. So Sasquatch is doing really well. Um, it's, it's a just an incredibly cool company that I'm, I'm really enjoying working with. So let's, let's, I, I, I want to get a, an understanding here. So you, you're coming into Sasquatch and what kind of role are you playing? I mean, you've got so much in your arsenal you could offer an organization like this. What, what role do they have you? So I'm doing, I'm usually playing one of two roles. One is what I'll affectionately call CEO whisperer, right? Like mm -hmm. how do we just run the company in a more effective way or accelerate growth or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. right? so there's a general management and sort of leadership components of what I'm offering. Sure. The other is a fractional CRO, right? So many of the companies in this scaling stage have built an amazing product, but they don't know how to get to market fast. They don't know how to up level their sales talent. They don't know how to, have conversations with larger clients and, and that kind of thing. And this fractional C CRO idea is amazing to me, right? Because I am starting to talk like the more and more founders I'm talking to are like, hey, I don't, I can't, I don't have the budget for like that five hundred thousand dollar a year CRO who I know could probably do wonders for me, um, but I just can't take that big of a bet, and I don't even know if I have enough capacity to have this person full time. Like, if I just had somebody mentor coach my teams and run them in their process to help drive revenue then it makes a ton of sense and you're starting to see it more and more like we've always had you know fractional cfos around startups but yeah. this fractional cro concepts pretty new and you're i'll say you're one of like the pioneers in it right now um but it makes us so much sense well i feel like it's working well i mean the ability to go in and set the house up on a fractional basis is definitely possible mm -hmm. um you know, the idea of, of uh, bringing in, again, as I say, just now 20 years of experience and how to lead these teams and, and engage with customers and figure out markets and all that stuff has definitely been a strong start, right? I'm, I'm eight sure. months in now. I don't want to, you know, make any claims on being a genius at this stage, but um, it's working, right? The ability to offer that time and, and have an impact right away in a way that's affordable to a company that doesn't have a lot of cash lying around. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's also, I would say, too, super fun. Right. So like the, the ability to go in and have an impact and operate quickly and not mm -hmm. have all the encumbrances of working in a large company is definitely a good time. And I'm really enjoying that aspect of it. But I think there's also significant opportunities to, again, my kind of primary objective here is to keep scaling technology companies in Canada and show, you know, provide them mm -hmm. the opportunity to not leave. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's one of them. The other guys that I, I got to mention are, are certain um, online background check company, uh, Sounds really simple when you say it fast, and it is, but the ability to automate the background check process for hiring is yeah. extremely impactful, right? So of course. you're taking lead times down from you know 10 days and 200 bucks to like 15 minutes and 50 bucks, so you can make really good decisions about who you bring in your shop right. fast. Um, incredible team at certain, uh, they've got the tiger by the tail, growing, growing really quickly, and helping those guys, and it's the same way, sort of that cross between CEO whisperer, just figuring out how to call the shots, what investments to make, when to, you know, how to scale teams up, but then also uh, revenue driving activity as well. Like how do we, um, you know, staff up sales teams, go after different markets, build partnerships, like that kind of stuff. That and and, and as a, as, and speaking as a founder myself, I mean, this is invaluable knowledge, right? Like I love having someone with me who has that 20, 25 years of experience that's different from mine and brings a different perspective and says, hey, I got playbooks and I got ways to help you build a foundation here to make you super successful. Let's accelerate that path, right? And yeah, you know, the way that I've described this in the past. Because it's was tough, it's tough. I mean, in the old days, like I, if I wanted to work with you, Rory, it would be, I'd have to go compete with Twitter Canada. Like, come on, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, it's tough for a startup to go do that, but I mean, and now you, organizations are able to tap into you and, and extract a ton of value, um, for you to, to help them drive their goals. Yeah, I, definitely. The experience that I speak to is when I went to do that startup a million years ago now, Right. Uh, the way that I used to describe that experience was that like every day by nine o'clock in the morning, I'd get a phone call to solve a problem that I didn't know how to fix. Right. Right. Like, There's a brand new problem every day for years. And the ability to have somebody else who's kind of hit the outside curveball a few times and knows how to read a picture, yeah, uh, you know, it helps. It's just an opportunity to leverage experience and, and thinking that you know you don't really can't get unless you do it. It's similar to what we we're talking about before. So 
Um, that's been fun. You know, just the ability to yeah, absolutely on a founder's wing and help with some experience that we've, we've, I've seen along the way. I will tell you too, you know, I'm learning a ton as well, right? So it's not like I know everything and I'm, you know, laying down all this knowledge is that I've seen stuff before and I've solved some of these issues, but also to be around the founder community, I mean, God, what better business community is there to learn from than super hard charging, aggressive, visionary founders who don't take no for an answer for anything, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. It, it keeps me on my toes and I'm definitely feeling like I've, I continue to evolve and grow as a professional by doing it. Oh, absolutely. I, I say this all the time. It doesn't matter if you're an intro that comes into tribal skill. There's, there's going to be one, two, three, five, ten things that I'm going to learn yeah. from them, right? Like you're going to learn and, and feed off each other's energy, when you're, especially when you're around smart, you know, type A personality people who are, who are driven like entrepreneurs are. For sure. You've been a master at capturing revenue. What are some of yeah. your – like this is uh, an area where we have been finding – um, founders really like start to struggle with. They might be the engineering founder who's not doesn't have a knack for sales or generating revenue, but has built this amazing product that has product market fit. What what could you? What's your advice to the entre entrepreneurs out there who are finding it tough to go out there and find revenue? Yeah. Um, so I'll give you Quoted a question. We could probably do like yeah. three I sessions on this. I'll give you a, you know four fastballs. Awesome. Um, the first and the most important to me is listen to customers, right? The market will tell you. Just go right. talk to them. Um, too many founders they, They'll are, probably be happy to talk to you too. Right, and they if are. You haven't, if you haven't talked to your customer and they are your customer, they'll be so happy that you, yeah, let me tell you how I'm using your right. product. Yeah. I mean, what I would share is part of the foundations of that, that startup that we started so long ago was involving customers in decisions that brands were making. And I've taken that lesson ever since. Just sure. giving somebody a mic and giving them the opportunity to tell you what they need and to really know how to listen to what they're saying and, and ask the right questions in that process is where you find money, right? Like Love it. From that unlocks a giant fountain of opportunity. There's a lot of skill that goes into figuring out who to talk to and how to get to them and what to ask them once you get there and all that stuff. But I think one of the, one of the most important tenets is just listen to your market Listen to your customers, talk to your customers. Don't Do be afraid ask. of it. Yeah. Okay. Tell them what they want. Um, two is break compromises, right? So it's one of the things I learned early on at BCG, this notion that there's all these sort of false trade-offs out there in the world. And I can give you a million examples mm -hmm. of, of the way things are and these compromises and trade-offs that we have to make. Look for them and break them, serially, right? Wherever you're trading off, don't. And see what happens. Find a okay. way to innovate around the compromise that means you can have both and eat, you have your cake and eat it too. Um, okay. Actually, very interesting. As very relates, interesting. That relates to deal structures. It relates to product development. It relates to go-to-market strategies. Just wherever you find a compromise, figure out how to break it, and you'll have an inherent competitive advantage. I guess the biggest one is you always have capacity issues. Well, if we do this, then we won't be able to do that. Let's find a way to do both. Right. How do you break that compromise? And there's usually, I would say 80% of the time, there is – an ingenious way to break the compromise. You just have to find it. I love it. Break the compromise. All right. So listen to your customers, break the compromise. Yeah. Number three, three is understand the market. We talked about this at the very beginning. Spend the hundred hours reading about what's going on. Know the quarterly reports and, and the annual reports and the CEO agenda and all the stuff that's publicly available. Read it, know it, understand it, use it to your advantage. Uh, sure. That's just wet equity and it helps, right? So do your homework, understand the market, not just your customers, but you know what they're saying in the press, what, what publicly available documents, what's happening in industry trends. Just know all that stuff. Like, don't leave your house before you feel like you know almost everything there is to know about a space that you want to play in. Absolutely, I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a real life tip on that. Just today, Alvin, again, you sitting beside me here at the office. I got CNBC on all day. It's not because I'm trade day trading. Uh, I'm a horrible day trader, so don't ever take my advice if I give it to you. But it's because I'm learning about what's happening in every vertical all day. And yeah. it, it's, it's really important to the business that we run. Right, right. So, and it's a, yeah. it's a huge competitive advantage. Like, be a yeah. sponge, right? Like, yeah. learn it all. And then the fourth is, is maybe a little more nuanced, but for me, the best revenue unlocks, the biggest opportunities, the best deals are around the best people. Right? So be really deliberate about working with the best in an industry or within a company or you know, in your own company and revenue follows. Right? So talent really does drive 
the ability to succeed, not only your own talent, but the talent that you surround yourself with and you work with. So, you know, I've often gone to very unorthodox partners because the person that I'm speaking with or the client that I'd be working with is just smarter and better than the one from the more polished brand. Um, right. Better deals, more revenue, higher growth happens when smart, great people work together. Um, and I've just found that to be a, a, a trend in the work that I've been doing. Rory, those are four excellent points. I agree with all of them. I'm actually learning from you right now. So after this podcast, I'm going to go make it rain and make you proud. <laughs> go, drive, go drive some revenue. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, man, for joining us on First Name Basis. Uh, this podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. We'll post it on Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, man. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it, man. Have a good one. Thanks. All right. Take care, man. Thank you.